John chapter 19, turn there please, appreciate you coming tonight, appreciate those of you that came, that you're up here. A lot of folks to pray for, and uh, a lot of things to keep in mind. Um, I don't. I I know I've mentioned this before, uh, but um, Brother Roy's nephew Al Hemphill, uh, he came visited here several years ago, and I got a chance to know him. And I I really like the guy. I do, and. Um, he has, he has worked in various uh, areas of our government as one of the good guys. Um, and he has sort of opened my eyes to uh, help me see um, some of the, um, some of the goings on in the United States government, things that aren't good. And he knows a lot of things that are not good. He's not given to conspiracy theories. He doesn't need them. He has facts. And um, uh, some things that he shared with me was, uh, number one, a lot of people in the, especially the uh, Department of Justice, very liberal, very liberal, leftist-leaning people in the Department of Justice. And that's a shame because... Uh, we know by experience that left-leaning judges, left-leaning prosecutors, uh, they do not administer justice the way justice needs to be administered in this country. Um, you know, I believe in mercy. I believe in uh, giving people a second chance and things like that. But after so often, you just got to pull people off the street because they're dangerous. And uh, liberals don't understand that, and I don't, I don't know that it's a, necessarily a, a uh, concerted effort to destroy the entire nation, but that, that is the direction that it's going. Uh, he also informed me that there are factions in the Pentagon that, um, that Obama brought in and gave power to them, and uh, very left-leaning uh, people, I remember back when Obama was president, uh, there was there was certain uh, generals that Obama had put in high positions that um, they absolutely despised um, the fact that we are friends with the nation of Israel. Uh, one person even writing um, uh, some sort of uh, I don't know, if uh, some kind of paper, uh, something like that, that basically said that America's uh, foreign policy in the Middle East is based upon Christian fundamentalism and how we see Israel. Number one, so, so what? Number two, we never have to worry about Jewish men getting on airplane flights and flying them into buildings. We never have to worry about um, Jewish uh, men or women that will strap bombs to themselves and blow themselves up along with innocent people. We never have to worry about things like that. But with the Islamic Arab states, you have to worry about that because they have proven over and over and over again that that's what they'll do. And uh, so anyway, Obama's people that he put into the Pentagon, uh, they do not like the fact that we keep Israel as our best and closest ally in the Middle East. But it is a matter of, of uh, national security that we favor Israel, that we join with Israel's fight against her enemies. And this past weekend, it wasn't just uh, a car bombing. It wasn't just somebody blowing up a bus. This was an act of war against the state of Israel, and Israel responded accordingly 
with an act of war. You have to understand, you're going to see on television, you're going to see on YouTube feeds, and you're going to see videos on Facebook. You're going to see that the, um, the Israeli Defense Force is launching an all-out assault on everything in the Middle East that is not Jewish. They are blowing up buildings, apartment buildings. They're blowing up factories. They're blowing up um, Hamas's ability to wage war. Um, and just because there are um, civilians who live in and around those places, that's done strategically. Hitler did the same thing. He put people all around his, uh, his airplane factories, uh, his tank factories and so on, and just dared the United States and the Allies to bomb them. Well, we did. We bombed them. And uh, if the uh, German people wanted Hitler as their leader and they wanted to wage war against the rest of the world, then that's what they got. And it's, uh, to me, it's the same thing right now. And uh, so anyway, uh, he keeps me informed every day, usually about what's going on. And one of the things that I uh, heard from him this morning, now, th again, this is not somebody who's, who is uh, making money on the Internet with wild-eyed conspiracy theories. He knows people. He has contacts both uh, amongst the American intelligence um, system and the Jewish intelligence system. And um, uh, the, um, the Palestinians have taken at least a hundred babies that we know of and beheaded them. And I guarantee you they, they recorded it. Guarantee you they did. And um, I don't, I, that is an atrocity that has nothing to do with standard warfare. So um, they meant to do that, although I, to me it just doesn't make sense. All you're going to do is get the people of Israel, and the state and the nation of Israel, to launch against um, the people who are, about, who are behind Hamas and those terrorist organizations to launch a full-scale war upon their enemies and they will not stop until the victory is absolutely in their hands. No peace treaty, no uh, softening, uh, the fact that Netanyahu is still prime minister means that Netanyahu will fight until the very end. That's who he is. And, um, and I ran too. And I don't care. Uh, I don't care who on Facebook doesn't like me anymore. Um, I'm going to stand with Israel. And if you want to stand against them, you go right on ahead. But I, if I were you and I were smart, I wouldn't do it. Yeah, you can stand with us. Uh, we believe in the, the nation of Israel. In fact, we already get, a, already get an Israeli flag and hang it out here in the front. So it ain't, like, it ain't like we already don't have enough enemies. Yeah. That hate us and trying to do everything in the world to destroy us. John chapter 19, if you would, please. Uh, Y'all pray for me. I'm not feeling very well this evening. And uh, I would ask for your prayers uh, tonight. Um, and I, I don't know if it's because I'm not feeling well uh, that I also feel this way as well, or it's just, I don't know. But I just, I don't know. I'm down tonight. Um I'm not feeling well physically, not feeling well emotionally. And so if you would just pray for me tonight. John chapter 19, um, the, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. We looked at the, um, 
the crown of thorns that Jesus wore and studied some things of that. And I, I may hit one more thing before we move on, but let's go to the Lord in prayer and let's ask God where to go tonight with his word. Father, we do love you. And I thank you, dear God, for all of those that you've gathered into this room. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you would stir up the hearts of your people, Lord. Um, Lord, who don't see the value of gathering together and, and hearing your word and having your word taught, having your word preached. Lord, there is great value of learning more and more. Uh, from what is in this sacred book. Father, I'm not done studying it out. I, there, I haven't learned everything that I need to learn from this book. I still have a lot to go. And so, Lord, it is a joy for me to open up its pages, to read it, to study it, to know it, to memorize it. And I pray, Heavenly Father, God, that you would, uh, that you would stir up your people, Lord, that they would have a desire to want to gather together with us, join us as we study your word, both here and, Father, the people online. I pray, God, that you would open up our eyes and our ears and give us, uh, Father, Lord, some wonderful things, Lord, that uh, we can both uh, re rejoice in ourselves and then we can be glad to share with other people who need to hear it. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would... Uh, Again, Lord, just open up our eyes and our ears and our hearts tonight as we study your word. Father, we pray, Lord, for the people of Israel. We pray for Prime Minister Netanyahu. We pray, dear God, for the soldiers. We pray for all of those who stand ready to defend uh, their land against all of their enemies. And I pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, that uh, even God, that if, if necessary... Father, that you would bring tremendous defeat upon the people of Israel to cause them to cry out unto you, God, to be their Savior. Nothing is more important than that. And I know, Lord, that it's in your word. I know, Father, that it is in the pages of this book. It's prophesied. It is going to happen. And Father, whatever you have to do to open the eyes of the people of Israel, Father, would you do that? Bless and honor your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Uh, one thing I do want you to do before we get too far in, in, into Gen, uh, John 19, turn to 2 Corinthians uh, 12. And um, I just want to touch on... Uh, this uh, crown of thorns that Jesus wears to the cross and uh, what Paul was referring to when he mentioned um, his thorn in his flesh and why it wouldn't go away when he prayed. In 2 Corinthians 12, uh, let's read, uh, let's go ahead and read in verse 1 and we'll move our way down. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. Um, if you understand a little bit about Paul and his life, uh, when he was, before he was called by Christ on the road to Damascus, Paul was uh, gung-ho all the way about going to Damascus, finding Christians there, bringing them back to Jerusalem so that they could be tried convicted and hanged or stoned for believing in Jesus Christ. Paul, uh, the Bible says, Saul was breathing out threats and murders against the disciples of the Lord. And so um, Paul was a very, very arrogant man and a zealot concerning uh, the Jewish law, the Jewish ways, and so on. And so he says, it is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth such a one caught up to the third heaven. 
So this person that Paul's referring to rose up above the upper atmosphere. He rose up then above the universe as high and as far out as the edges of the universe. I don't mean the edges of the solar system or the edge of the galaxy that we're in or the, the edge of whatever cluster we're in. I'm talking about the edge of space that we can't even, we, we have no idea where it is. Then to the third heaven where God himself is. And he says in verse 3, And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. He heard such glorious things that men cannot even utter those, those words that he heard. Verse 5, Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. You know, if Kenneth Copeland and, and um, Creflo Dollar and Joyce Myers and all of these other wackos would have this same attitude in their heart, they wouldn't be such bad people. But you hear them constantly boasting about how they can do this and how they can how they can do that and how they can speak in tongues and about how they can heal people and how how the disease never has uh, never has uh, any uh, never takes any hold on them. Kenneth Copeland actually boasted that uh, he could speak to his hair and it not turn gray. You know, Kenneth Copeland's up in his 80s. He's in his 80s. He's probably 83, 84, 85 years old, something like that. And he spoke to his hair in faith that it would not turn gray, and it has not turned gray. So any of you that might think he's got using Grecian formula, you're crazy. Yeah, no, it won't work. He's lying through his teeth is what he's doing. But anyway, uh, here he says, uh, verse 7, Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, and lest I should be exalted above measure. Now, here's what he's saying. A thorn, we've already learned this from other places in the Bible, a thorn is a spirit. It's a devil, okay? It's not just uh, a, a rose bush thorn or uh, a thistle or we used to call them sticker bushes when we would run through the woods when I was little uh, and you run into that pile of sticker bushes and you're screaming loud and everything like that, getting them off of you. But these are actual spirits and he, and he names it. He says, a thorn in the flesh and then right after that, a messenger of Satan to buffet me lest I should be exalted above measure. In other words, Paul said because he went 14 years by himself and met with Jesus every day, and every day Jesus showed up and taught him the doctrines, the lessons, the, what the sacrifice means, what the Passover means, what all of the prophecies means. I think Paul knew probably most everything there is to know. I think Paul knew it. And Paul's nature was, if I know all these things, Bo, I tell you what, I'm, my nature is people better listen to me. If they want anything, they better come to me to get it. And that was in his nature. He was a very, very proud person. But God gave him this thorn, and it was a devil and a messenger of Satan. And this messenger of Satan, we're not told in what way, but he would buffet Paul every day. Now, when Paul asked thrice for this thing to be gone, when I was studying this out and trying to discern what this thorn was, when it occurred to me that Paul asked God three times, there was my answer. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, 
pride of life. Now, we don't know exactly what Paul's deal was, but he's already mentioned uh, because of the abundance of revelations given to me, there was given a thorn in the eye. So I suspect pride of life. With you, it may not be pride of life. It may be lust of the eyes. Or it may be lust of the flesh in various forms. But one way or the other, everybody in this room, everybody not in this room, everybody watching online, there is a thorn in your flesh. God is the one who put it there. And if God decides to remove it, he will, by his grace and his goodness, he will remove it. But it may be that he removes one and gives you another one. Bottom line is, you're not getting out of this world without a devil chasing you all the way into heaven. And so he's, and in that he says, uh, verse 8, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I have my thorns. And I've seen them over the course of my life change. I've seen them change. Uh, at one time in my youth, it, let's say from the time I was in Bible college and then past that, um, Really, before I came here, my biggest thing was pride. I was very prideful of uh, what I could do as a, as a young preacher. I had told myself one time, Mike, you could probably apply for and get just about any church that you want. And uh, God, heard my, God heard my brain think that. And God said, oh yeah? And so God took my pride away but he gave me a different thorn and I didn't like it I don't like it to this day I don't like it uh, but God gave it to me now upon my death the power of those thorns will at will diminish and go away because Christ bore that crown of thorns upon his head so that when he died, their power dies with it. When I die, and if I die in Christ, which I have every reason to believe I will, then the power of those thorns will cease in me and I will never, ever, ever have to deal with those ever again. And I'll be thanking God for eternity that I don't have to deal with those anymore. For eternity, I'll be praising God and not having to deal with this. Now, um, so you can probably look at your life right now and see what your thorn is. Maybe it's um, something related to uh, lust of the flesh. Uh, and that doesn't always have to do with something that's dirty or lascivious or fornication or anything like that. Um, you can want, at, at one time, I wanted acceptance. I wanted everybody to accept me and everybody to like me and everybody to, to think that I was really something. Okay, that was a lust in my flesh. Lust of the eyes. We talk about lust of the eyes and... And, and, you know, talk about how people s see things on the Internet or look th at things on the Internet that they shouldn't look at. That doesn't always have to do with something filthy or something lascivious. It could be your problem is you like, maybe if you're a guy, maybe you like new tools and you like, um, you like uh, new s ski boats or you like, uh, you like to go fishing, and so anything related to fishing you like, that's, and every time you see something like that that's brand new, boy, you got to have that, and so on and so on. And that is a, that is a, uh, uh, 
a lust that you have with your eyes. You look at those, you go to Bass Pro Shop and just go, oh, I wish I had that, wish I had that, wish I had that, wish I had that. And we can get into those things like that. But the bottom line is everybody has them. And they're there so that um, we don't get too far away from what God wants in our lives, for what God wants us to do, and so on. And he uses those to keep us so that when we do something for God, we don't jump up down and toot our own horn and take all the glory for it. Yay, I did this. I did. Look at me. Look at how, look at what I'm doing. Look at how I'm doing this and how I'm doing that. I've done that before. I have done that before. And I can tell you that uh, God had mercy on me in every thorn that I've ever had. He's had mercy on me. Now, Let's go to John chapter 19. John chapter 19. The Bible says, Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. The soldiers platted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. That was the proclamation that Herod made when Jesus was born. Where is he that is to be born King of the Jews? He was King of the Jews at his birth, King of the Jews 33 and a half years later. And when he comes back, he will still be king of the Jews. Amen. I just don't know. I don't know. If, I think we ought to go and drop Bibles all around where Hamas is and underline all the places where God said Jesus is the king of the Jews. Maybe they'll read it and think twice before attacking the people whose king is none other than Jesus Christ. Oh, I, I doubt that it'd have much effect, but I, I think it'd be neat if we could. Amen. Don't drop bombs first. Drop King James Bibles. Give them a chance to read it. And when they laugh and mock and scoff it, then drop the bombs on them. Amen. Amen. Verse 4. Pilate therefore uh, went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. And this is Pilate now. Pilate is dealing with Roman law. And under Roman law, Pilate can find nothing wrong with him, much less not anything worthy of him being put to death. So, he says, I, I, don't know what you, I don't know what you want from me, but I don't find anything wrong with him. I find no fault whatsoever. Verse 5. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto them, Behold, the man. Underline that passage in your Bible. Behold the man. Underline that. Because, and you guys have heard me teach this before, but um, go to Isaiah 34. Turn to Isaiah 34. In Isaiah 34, here it is, I found it in my Bible. Uh, let's see here. Let's pick it up in 
verse 7 because it's going to mention unicorns and we have to ask ourselves is unicorns real are there are there really unicorns and if you are of the opinion that the bible is using a metaphor language or mythological language or the bible is dealing in make believe and so it doesn't really it says unicorns but it doesn't really mean unicorns then you need to change your attitude you need to change your outlook you need to change your theology because if god said unicorns boom unicorns and he said, and the unicorn shall come down with them and the bullocks with the bulls and their land shall be soaked with blood and their dust made fat with fatness. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. And he said, the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch. What is pitch? Huh? It's tar. So the streams and, and now think about it. The streams are going to start issuing forth oil. That ought to be good, right? And isn't it something that out of all the nations that are in the Middle East, Israel is the only one where you will not find a drop of oil anywhere. Do what? I've not heard that. I've not heard that. Maybe they have. I don't know. But there's just no oil. There is no Weinstein Oil Company. Okay? Um, the Arabs all around them got oil everywhere. Israel, poor Israel, don't. But here we have oil. The streams thereof shall be turned into pitch. The dust thereof into brimstone. The land thereof shall become burning pitch. Verse 10, it shall not be quenched night nor day. The smoke thereof shall go up forever. From generation to generation, it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. Now he says in verse 11, this is where he gets into these weird creatures. The cormorant and the bittern shall possess it. The owl also and the raven shall dwell in it. And he shall stretch upon it. Uh, out upon it the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness. And they shall call the nobles thereof to the kingdom, but none shall be there. And all her princes shall be nothing. No nobles, no kings, no famous people there. They're not there. And thorns shall come up in her palaces. There's thorns again. Nettles and brambles in the fortresses thereof. And it shall be an habitation of dragons and a court for owls. So we've got owls. We've got, um, we've got the uh, unicorns mentioned here. Dragons. Verse 14. Wild beasts of the desert shall also meet with the wild beasts of the island. And the satyr. There's satyrs. What are those mythological creatures? Well, the way some people think they are, but I believe they're real. The satyr shall cry to his fellow. The screech owl also shall rest there and find for itself a place of rest. There shall the great owl make her nest and lay and hatch and gather under her shadow. There shall the vultures also be gathered, every one with her mate. And then if you look in Isaiah 13, all of these creatures are gathered there because God has made the land desolate. If we pick it up in, oh, uh, let's see here. Yeah, verse 11. God says, uh, I will punish the world for their evil, the wicked for their iniquity, and I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. And I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. Therefore, I will shake the heavens and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. And it shall be as the chaste roe and as a sheep that no man taketh up. They shall, uh, they shall every man turn to his own people and flee everyone into his own land. So where is all the men gone? They left. Now, uh, if we move on down to um, 
19, Babylon, the glory uh, of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and it shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation, neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. But the wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, and their houses shall be full of doleful creatures. The owls shall dwell there, and satyrs shall dance there, and the wild beasts of the islands shall cry in their desolate houses, dragons in their pleasant palaces, and her time is near to come, and her days shall be prolonged. But bottom line is, it's because all the man is gone. When the man is gone, these creatures move in. So let's go back to um, John 19, when Pilate says, Behold the man. Uh, you have a, um, another verse that goes along with um, when it comes to the, the mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. And so the man is Christ. The man mentioned here in John 19 is Christ. The man where Paul mentioned it, the man, Christ Jesus, it's Christ Jesus. When the man is present, the dragons and the owls, and uh, everything else, they will, they will not be present. When Christ is gone, when the man has left, when the man is no more, then these creatures will move in. Um, I don't have time to get into all that, but let's, let's keep reading in John. Pilate says, Behold the man. Verse 6, when the chief priest therefore and the officers saw him, they cried out saying, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. In other words, if you're going to do this, let it be on you. I'm not crucifying him. I'm not doing it. I find no fault in this man, and I'm not touching him. If he has broken your law, then you take him and do with him what you please. But I'm not doing it. So in verse 7, the Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Now, Jesus didn't break any laws by making himself the Son of God, did he? No, he was the Son of God. No doubt about it. So verse 8, When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid. And went again into the judgment hall and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Notice and pay attention to this. Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee? And have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldest have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. Jesus basically saying to Pilate, Pilate's going, Don't you know how much power I've got over you? Uh, Pilate, the only power that you have over me is what power God has given you over me. Other than that, you don't have any power over me. You don't have the power to kill me. You don't have the power to not kill me. You have, you have no power whatsoever except what God has given you. And, and people, I want you to understand something. This will help you uh, maybe in days to come. Uh, I know that there are a lot of very bad, evil things wrong with our government. 
There are very corrupt politicians on the local level, on the county level. There are corrupt politicians in Jefferson City, Missouri, where our state capital is, our legislature, the Missouri Supreme Court, the governor's office. There's corruption in all of those places. There is corruption in Washington, D.C., that if we knew how deep the corruption ran in Washington, D.C., more than likely we would just simply take whatever weapons we had and try to overthrow the government because of its corruption. I'm not advocating that, YouTube. So don't take this video down and slap me with another strike. But I'm just saying there is an overwhelming amount of corruption that is in government. Um, who remembers? Sister Betty, you remember in Kansas City uh, back in 1981, it was at a hotel, a higher regency hotel in Kansas City, and the, they, had these, they had these big dance parties, and the walkways that people were on collapsed and killed like over a hundred people. There's a documentary on YouTube, and I've been watching it, and um, some of the, some of the uh, rescue people that reported to that that night to try to rescue people said that the people who died in that were unrecognizable as be even being humans. That's how bad they were smashed. And what they determined was is that it could have been avoided. But because there was corruption, corruption by the, um, the, um, the builder, corruption by the, uh, the inspectors who would have inspected the concrete, inspected the, uh, the, how the thing was put together, and maybe even uh, corruption in, in the mayor's office somehow, some way. I don't know, I haven't got that far yet. But it was basically corruption that killed all of those people in that. That was a horrible thing that happened. And um, that kind of corruption still exists. We had, we, we had up in St. Louis, Kim Gardner, the prosecutor who never prosecuted a case. She was, she was in her second term and never prosecuted a case. That's how bad the corruption is okay and if we were to understand just how bad the corruption was we just probably would just go nuts in this country and it's around the world and yet jesus says to the corrupt officials you have no power except the power that i give you knowing they corrupt and knowing that they had to trump up charges and bring in false witnesses against Jesus in order for all of this to take place. Thou couldest have no power at all against me except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. And whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. So let me read this and, and we'll be dismissed. In verse, verse 13, When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that it is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it's called the court of the pavement. And it was a place of judgment where everybody would gather Pilate would hear the case, and then he would rule upon it. And it was the preparation of the Passover at about the sixth hour. And he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. 
Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he, and he bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew, Golgotha. Where they crucified him and two other with him on either side, one and Jesus in the midst. And in verse 19, and Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city. But I want you to, one thing I want you to know, it was without the city. It was outside of Jerusalem because that fulfilled the law of the scapegoat where Jesus was crucified was not in the city. And it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. In other words, I'm not changing it. You can be mad at me all you want to. But I'm not writing that we're accusing him of being king of the Jews. I think the Holy Ghost had Pilate write down these words to his man who was going to carve this into a plate. Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. And in all four Gospels, you have variances about what they say, but all four of them say the King of the Jews. And so for all of you online, quote unquote, Bible experts who think you know more than anybody else, who think that uh, because you've read some conspiracy theories by certain people and you've fallen into it that you know more than anybody else and that God hates the Jews now. He's angry with them all the time and he's going to kill them and they're the ones responsible for all the evil things that have happened. In fact, they say the Jews were responsible for 9-11. And anything that goes on in this country, they like to pin on some Jewish conspiracy somewhere but I'm here to tell you that God still says that Jesus is the king of the Jews and one of these days he's going to prove it he's going to prove it 